<laughs> this is Karen with NewClevelandRadio.net, and it is time for the premiere of Super Ager with my best friend in the whole world right now, because I'll tell you, Elise Marie, I need to learn how to age better and feel better. Um, I'm just one of those type A personalities and I just can't seem to change. So I'm looking forward to this podcast because I have a feeling that a lot of us are going to learn little tips and tricks that we may never have thought about before. So welcome. Thank you so much, Karen. I'm really excited about this podcast and just thrilled um, to give everyone tips and tricks uh, about how to super age. And um, I think it's great that you type A. I mean, in fact, I celebrate that because as a yoga teacher by trade, that's one of the things I'm trained to do. And I do besides writing and researching how to super age, I, um, I hang around with a lot of yoga teachers. That doesn't mean my family members are not, you know, they're not all calm. So it's great to have someone that is not in that ilk, so to speak, to talk to, because I get different. I, I learn more from talking to someone who's a type A than another yoga teacher. And especially I teach one of the forms of yoga that I teach is restorative yoga, which um, I used to have a Japanese uh, student and she described it best. She called it do nothing yoga. Oh, <laughs> that I like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you may, and that may, that's the other thing I think sometimes people don't realize, I know we've discussed this before, we'll have to fill everyone in, but there's so many types of yoga and, and I think there's a type for everyone and yoga literally means union. So I always break it down to the simplest, the simplest thing. It's like, when you feel good, you're in union with yourself, you're in better union with your loved ones. Um, because if you're feeling out of sorts, if you're feeling disconnected, which to me is the opposite of union, sure. then you're not feeling good. You're not going to be nice to your friends and family and <laughs> the union's out the window. <laughs> well, and you know, recently I've been writing my blogs about depression and it's not so much about clinical depression. Like a lot of us, you know, think about it's about those ups and downs during the day that maybe you wake up and you feel really good, you're energized and something happens, okay? Um, you know, the other morning I was brushing my teeth and I was feeling really good, but something happened while I was brushing my teeth. And I could just feel this, you know, cloud come over me. And I realized that we go through this and yet, some of us acknowledge it, many of us don't. And acknowledging it is the first step, but the real step is knowing how to work with it. And that's one thing I don't because I, I fight it. And that's my type A coming out. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, there's so many, so many things um, that we could highlight about that. I mean, one is learning little techniques. And one thing I would say about, maybe we should, we should say what a super ager is, and then I could explain how sure. I've learned from super agers. I mean, it's not really a dictionary definition kind of thing, but I did, um, I did write a book called Super Ager. And I also, then after I wrote this book, I got a degree in gerontology because I loved the study of aging for many reasons. Um, but we can define what a super ager is because people always ask me what it is and how I came to write the book. I can tell you how I came to write the book, okay. but I'll tell you what a super ager is. Um, so I'm reading from page 14. What is a super ager? The concept has been attributed to Dr. Marcel Masulam, a cognitive neurologist who used the term to describe older adults who had memory skills and attention spans typical of individuals several decades younger. Middle-aged superagers study by Northeastern University showed that it is possible to have the brain power of a 27-year-old, even when you're 64. Other studies have demonstrate, demonstrated instances where adults age 80 and older still have the cognitive ability of someone half their age. 
In recent years, the term superager has been used to describe older adults who demonstrate the brain power of someone many years younger. But the superager concept is broader and includes those older adults who have athletic ability, creative inspiration, looks and spunk of someone two to six decades younger. And um, there is a show, you can look up this internet video, Approaching 100 Secrets, Secrets of the Superagers was a BBC News series. It just shows different um, you know, athletes, professors, different people. So there really isn't definition. So I like to just take it on. It's just, it's fun. And the other thing I would say that I recently talked about in a um, Facebook Live that I did, which is we have this internal energy. It's sort of like our, it could be for you, that internal energy is very expressive. It's, it's almost fiery because in Indian medicine and also traditional Chinese medicine, there's elements, you know, even personalities, we see that they have elements. And we also wanna honor that. So it's good if you are type A or you're fiery or a go-getter to honor that, to not squish it out. Sure. But that's sort of our, our energy field or, our, it's kind of unconscious. It's what, you know, I, I try to describe it in Western terms. Maybe you can describe how you would experience it. But then we have our body, which our body will deteriorate. I mean, with time, aging, um, you know, it starts actually in utero. Aging actually starts when at the moment of conception, because we're moving through time and we're not necessarily in the beginning deteriorating, but that is unless some of these biohackers, some of the biohackers <laughs> figure out, how, it's very complicated aging, but if it gets figured out, there is people that want to live to a thousand. That's a whole nother podcast. Not me, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyway, so I just think of expanding our idea of aging as well, because we have, we have that internal energy and then merging it with the, the physical. I think in that we, we honor ourselves and that's kind of what the union helps us with. So there's many angles that I take on this and I try to just help people to become inspired to get older because what I've realized in my research is there's so many older adults from 50 to 110 that are having just incredible experiences. And I think that we've, we've got a negative uh, view of aging. Well, you know, it's interesting because yesterday I interviewed uh, a musician, uh, a vocalist. She's really exciting. Um, her name is um, Elisa. And um one of the things Elisa says is that it's you're never too old to experience something, okay? If there's something that you want to do, you can do it at any age. And when I read that comment, I realized that that is the message that we give in most of our podcasts here, that age should not be your barrier, whether you're 10 years old and you want to be, you know, a prima ballerina, you know, you know, start taking lessons and building your body and, and go for it. Or um, like our friend, Barbara Rose Brooker, who wants to be, you know, a movie star, she could be a movie star. Um, all you have to do is want it and go for it. Now, the question is, you know, like we were talking about What's the interpretation of a superager? Well, our interpretation is all going to be what we see ourselves as. And that's what I like about um, this show because I may say, hey, you know, there are certain things that I'm, I want to do, but there are certain things that I choose not to. And, you know, that's my way of aging and living and taking those steps forward. So I know in a previous podcast, when you were a guest um, on one of our other shows, we talked about the fact that uh, you come from a background of yoga. And many of us uh, who've never really experienced yoga other than seeing it on YouTube or hearing um, somebody like talk about it, we picture yoga as being a um, double jointed person, basically. Okay. And one of the things that you told me was 
no, that's really not yoga. So do you want to sort of explain that to our listeners? Yeah, there's so many layers to that question. I think one thing when you first started talking about it, Karen, I thought a lot of us, I think images really sort of sear ourselves, sear themselves into our consciousness. And because of the internet, and even before that, I think the images that we saw of yogis were of often men contorted with their foot behind their head or crazy back bends. And those can be, you know, they can sort of draw people in in a certain level. There's a lot of Instagram yogis that have incredible follow. And I have to say, you know, I don't always look those up, those accounts up, but sometimes when I see them, I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> but that is very surface. And if we talk about aging in the body, I mean, not everybody has, you know, a body that can contort in that way. There's so many, someone may have a disability, but yoga, again, I come back to, it means union. When I trained in yoga, uh, we, we trained in how to work with people in wheelchairs that may, may even need assistance to get into two poses in one hour. And that was, I trained a long time ago, but I was in a very good yoga school um, that was called Pima Yoga at the time with Rodney Yi and a bunch of other teachers. Um, now there's a movement because of the perceptions, there's uh, various movements of you know yoga for everybody and um, yoga for different types. So if you look around, you will find um, it's there's much more and maybe we can even interview some of the leaders in those movements because they could also give us even more information on this, you know, that it is not about contorting at all. And uh, <laughs> it's about your feeling good in your body. And I try to remind everyone of that. My main teacher, Judith Lassiter, has really specific ways that She's trained her students to be, um, she's trained extensively in nonviolent communication and she actually studied with the main founder. And so through her, I've even learned how to communicate to people so they don't feel bad or wrong because that's not the idea. It's always about connection. And when we feel bad or wrong, we disconnect, right? Absolutely. And I think I shared that with you. I went to um, a yoga class. I was invited in by a, a friend and um, she was leading the class. And I was looking around and everybody obviously had been coming there for quite a while. Um, and they all sort of like knew what to do. And they all looked so, they all looked so perfect to me. And uh, I went in number one with a bad knee. So I was having trouble there. And then, you know, trying to balance. And um, I, I felt silly. Now, I don't think I really expressed that completely in class. I sort of went along with it. But at one point, there was a position, I don't remember what it was, but I couldn't get into it. And there was a woman who was next to me. And she turned to me and she said, you're doing that all wrong. And it was like, I just stopped. It was like, you know what, then this isn't for me. And I sat there with my legs crossed and I sort of watched everybody else, but I was breathing and paying attention to my breath. And when we were done, I was able to have a conversation with the instructor because I had allowed myself to connect to my thoughts through my breathing, rather than be upset by this person who's telling me I'm doing it wrong. I knew I was doing it incorrectly, maybe not wrong, but not in the way that it probably would have given me that unity that you're talking about. So you mentioned that when you first started training, you trained with people in wheelchairs. So what does a person in a wheelchair do for yoga? What are some of the things that they can do? That's a great question. Um, and I, I now teach regularly uh, seated yoga, chair yoga. The, the class I'm teaching particularly uh, is for older adults. Some may be in wheelchairs and some are sitting in chairs. Sometimes we get out of the chairs. Um, but I'm sorry, now I forgot. We, the question was, 
um, how did I train in wheelchairs? Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, basically um, you can do, I mean, seated mountain. So just sitting, um, you can sit and be, now I see my collar, I need to straighten my collar. <laughs> we straighten ourselves out, so to speak. Okay. <laughs> and, and just uh, all the poses have, I would say almost like a musical note, a sort of a signature, and they can always be, uh, you know, decreased or increased, so to speak. Okay. So a back bend, maybe I'm just kind of taking my shoulders back. And if I don't have that much mobility, I'm just lifting my chest a little more. Okay. So in a seated yoga class, uh, depending on the person, if a person's in a wheelchair, if how much mobility they have in their upper body, um, they, I, I always give variation. So to me, it's all about the variations and whatever you can do. Um, I also teach intergenerational classes where I have, I've had um, four generations together exciting. and yeah, it was, it's very exciting. And this came about because I had this private client and her family came to visit. She, she often had, she had a business and often people in her business would join and she had a little yoga area in her home. And so one time her mother uh, came to visit and she had just become a grandmother. Uh, and so we had a mother, a, a baby and a grandmother and great grandmother. So I had the great grandmother sitting and doing the poses. And then the baby, I think babies are just naturally living yoga. We just look at them, right? And we feel right. good. <laughs> so the baby just brought us all good energy. <laughs> and, and then I've done variations on that with teenagers in groups, such as uh, reunions or um, yeah, family reunions, class reunions, or uh, what I'm thinking of a, an anniversary party, a 20 year anniversary party. And that in that way, anybody could be in a wheelchair and I just show them if they wanna do like warrior, they just reach their arms up. If they're unable to do that, you know, somebody, they, they could just sit taller. And as you mentioned in class, what you did so brilliantly when you were in that yoga class was you took a step back and you went to your breathing, which is always what I instruct my students to do, to just simply breathe. That's the most important thing. That's your foundation, as you noticed. And I think how human of us all, you know, what, what you talked about in that class was, I didn't do it right, but that's human to think right or wrong. Sure. Yet we're all just here giving ourselves empathy and compassion. And that's what I've learned from my teacher. That is the core breathing and giving each other empathy and compassion. So one of the things that I'm hearing from you that to super age, number one, we have to be within ourselves. It's about us. It's not about how anybody else looks at us or sees us. It's how we see ourselves. Uh, because there are some people who are very, um, I'll use the word mature, very mature when they're in their 20s and 30s. Um, and there are some people as late as their 80s and 90s who have a childlike personality. And not that they're, they don't have a memory. They, they're just fun loving. Um, so it's not about the number of the age. It's about where you are in that process. Am I correct? I, yeah, I a hundred percent agree. I think, and one thing you did touch on, which kind of loosely relates is ageism, what I would call ageism. Um, I think, I think we're always growing and evolving. And sometimes we might've had trauma and maybe that causes us to have to mature too early. You know, there's some with trauma who maybe had to almost carry their home because their parents had difficulties or who knows, there's so many circumstances. Um, there, the human condition is endless, right? And we're all, as you said, individuals in that process. And so I think when you said that, I thought there's some that may be mature beyond their years, they could be old souls, or they could be, sometimes there's uh, younger people that are acting older because they're, it's, it's out of fear. And that's okay too, it's human. I mean, I can't judge anyone's circumstances. 
and they may feel younger later. I've known a lot of people that started to say like, oh, I got to feel younger because I, I had to take care of my younger siblings because blah, blah, blah happened. So what you said was beautiful in that it is, speaks to so many different experiences. We could be 80 and then we're still containing that childlike wonder. Yes, absolutely. And that's why, you know, learning these different techniques, you know, we all know to breathe. Okay. And we do it just naturally without even thinking about it. I know um, in the past when I would get, you know, overwrought, um, my mother was always saying to me, just take a breath, just take a breath. And I would look at her and say, just stop telling me to do that. Um, because to me, I was breathing. Okay. But again, there's that personality coming out. Don't tell me what to do. I just have to keep doing but I've learned, uh, and that's part of my maturity, uh, especially in the last 10 years, you know what, when you feel that tightness coming on, when you feel that cloudiness coming on, um, start breathing, okay? Pay attention to the breathing, okay? Um, but I don't like when anybody tells me to breathe. And I know you do that in a yoga class. You, you, you'll you tell people, take that cleansing breath. Um, do you find people, you know, like, you know, get their, get out of sorts when you tell them things like that? Because I know it's just a mantra, basically. That's, that's a great question. It's a little different on Zoom because sometimes people have their cameras turned off. Sure. But always try to instruct in a neutral way. And that's part of that nonviolent communication, inviting people to try something rather than forcing, imposing something on them. So I may say, take a deep breath, um, but I'm trying to say it in a way that it's more of an invitation or I invite you to take a deep breath or try this. Uh, you may find this. So the wording is important, and I think the tone, um, and it's interesting because you made me think of a story when you talked about your fiery personality, <laughs> I would say, and, and that's in a very positive way, because sure. the sister science, and I talk about this in my book, Ayurveda, which is, it's really, it, some people call it Indian medicine, but it's the study of life, because in Eastern traditions, you know, life was... I mean, the way people even looked at things and observed it, it was, to me, it was scientific, but it was a different kind of science. They were looking at fire as an element or water. Some people are more flowy. Some people are, you know, stubborn and they're more earthy. But I remember when my son was, I think it was like first grade or something. And he was at a Quaker school, which the emphasis because Quakers are peaceful and we literally our team was called the peace. I just remembered we always called our team the peace. <laughs> and I also was aware through my study that there are some kids that they're literally born with that personality. I call it a fingerprint or a blueprint that's fiery. And you don't want to quelch that. You want to actually let it, you know, let it go and give give the child some, you know, somewhere to channel that because they need to channel that energy. So anyway, long story short, we were on a team. It was a soccer team. And this kid, I remember him because he was very fiery. <laughs> he had a fiery personality and he wanted to win. My son didn't. My son was air and he was staring at the clouds. So that shows, you know, like the metaphor. He was like in the soccer field, not doing his job, but like staring up into space. Or at one point, him and his friend dug a hole, like <laughs> in the poor kid at the game. And this kid, all he wanted to do was win. And his mom told him not to care, like kind of like just breathe. Sure, right. Imagine how far that went, you know, it just, you know, it was a big belly flop for that. So, so I think we need to also lean into whatever our nature is. So that's also what I hope to do in this podcast is give people, everyone's different. We're all absolutely unique. We have a lot of commonalities, but how can we each learn how to, you know, live in these bodies. And if we're blessed, live a longer life. And that to me is super aging. Well, and something that I, I'm picking up here is that this podcast is also going to help a lot of parents parent. Okay. And it was just your story that 
triggered me. Um, my youngest son is on the autism spectrum and uh, he was diagnosed before too many people even knew what autism was and how to, how to deal with it. And so, um, you know, we were always being told, oh, you got to do this, you got to do that. And we tried. And one day we had left his therapist's office and his therapist had, you know, had him make this chart in her office and he was going to follow this chart. At least that's what he told her. And um, he was, when he was with her, he was very compliant. You know, was, I'll do whatever you say, Dr. Martin, you are, you know, you're, you're the world. And we got in the car and he just threw this paper at us. And I think he was maybe seven or eight years old. And I said, why'd you do that? And he goes, this is nonsense. I'm not going to do this. It's not in my personality. And I looked at him and I thought, where did you learn all this? Okay. But now that I look back, we were trying to do what we told people not to do. We were trying to fit him into a square peg and he wasn't fitting. And until he became a teenager, and he could really start to express himself um, to the point that we could have these conversations. It was like, oh, no, you don't have to do that. If that doesn't work for you, um, no, you know, you feel more comfortable eating alone rather than eating with us. Because I understood it, it was like, then fine. You know, why should I make you sit at a dinner table with me um, even though we think it's the right thing, and as we talked about before, is there a right way or is there a wrong way? Um, when he was in his comfort zone and because he would eat alone, he then knew how to go do his homework and do the things he had to do. But when we told him, you know, this is the way to do it, you're going to sit at the dinner table with us and you're going to eat everything that's on your plate, um, the evening was a mess because he wasn't united. And I think that's a, you know, a great thing that we might be able to, you know, we're not going to tell people how to parent, but Hey, open our eyes. Let's see what's going on around us. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great story and great insight, great parenting. It's like, you knew how to follow your son's blueprint and that does have a huge impact on aging because nurturing um, at any age, but especially when we're younger, the more we grow ourselves as who we are, like what insight, you know, I think your, your son is very wise. And I've noticed that with um, those on the spectrum, they have this incredible wisdom that sometimes can't be fit into the norm, so to speak. So why not honor it? So I, I'm impressed. <laughs> and, and, and the interesting yeah. part is that he now fits into wherever he needs to. And if he doesn't feel comfortable, like all of us, okay. Um, you know, I don't always feel, feel comfortable walking into a room with strangers. Okay. Mm -hmm. I do it more than he might do it because mm -hmm. That's my type A personality. I'm not comfortable, but I'm going to do it because, hey, there's something in it for me. Whereas he's the one that would, you know, you know what? I don't know these people. I don't have to know these people. I'm not going to do it. And in the beginning, that was difficult for me. And then I started thinking about it. It's not my choice. It's his. And these are the little things that I've picked up that help me keep myself more grounded, um, but I need a lot more training. So <laughs> I'm looking forward to the weeks ahead. Yay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, and I hope to, oh, go ahead. ahead. I was so, going to say, and I hope to interview people also that will have interesting insights along these lines. Yes. So the book that you wrote, Super Ager, obviously we named the podcast after that. Um, how can people find it? 
It is on Amazon. It is on IndieBound. You can pretty much, and you can order it from your local bookstore. I've been doing that a lot, especially during the pandemic. We're recording this in January, 2021. So we don't know how things are going to change, but if you're watching in the future, (laughs) let us know. (laughs) Send smoke signals. No. Um, So yeah, you can order and keep uh, local bookstores. I've done that with many local bookstores to order and then you can go pick up the books. Yeah. And you also mentioned that you were doing some Zoom classes. So, and we understand that because of the pandemic and you happen to be out in California where there's even more restrictions than some other parts of the country. um, How are people relating to doing um, yoga or any kind of uh, group connection uh, on Zoom? Yeah, actually it's to me been surprisingly uh, wonderful. And I say that because I had another yoga teacher who, one yoga teacher who always said, why don't you, she told all of her students and she also teaches Ayurveda to go online <laughs> and some some were going online, but I, I just was like, well, there's, I mean, I'm in the Bay Area. There's so many students uh, that go to yoga all over town. So I, you know, and the, I live in the East Bay, San Francisco. I used to teach mostly in San Francisco. So I just didn't do anything online. And I was forced to right away in March because all the studios were shut down in California, which they have been continuously. Sure. Uh, they they might have opened up for a short period, but the studio I worked at, both of them never opened. There was a couple that opened temporarily. But what I found is there are benefits to being online. I mean, one clear one is you don't have to go anywhere. You just <laughs> you just put on your yoga clothes, get your mat out. I have to maybe get a little, you know, make sure I'm not disheveled because I'm on camera. And um, and then you're you're in the classroom. And the other thing I've really loved about it is I've had students that have moved out of the area and I've been able to reconnect with them. Um, people can bring their friends and family to class and they're, you know, we're, we're in times where maybe your family's across the country or literally um, I have students in France, I have students in Europe. And so they can join if I have a morning class. So I've done things like that. And um I also teach for an app that's just starting out for older adults and that one they're trying to build it out so that they might even get something different than zoom I use zoom for my regular classes and I also teach with a group of students I teach seated yoga and we do different modalities every week and that's through the USC school of social work so I have a lot of fun on zoom and I think people enjoy it and there is a feeling a different feeling. And I think those of us that have taken those classes or been on Zoom, we're always surprised at the connection on Zoom, right? I mean, we didn't realize (laughs) how powerful it could be until we were all forced (laughs) into it. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, um, when we first started podcasting, everything we did was audio podcasting. And um, I took a Zoom class and it was in that class. And I thought, you know, this is the way I want to do the podcasting. And the reason being, number one, we can convert them to be audio as well, which for your listeners, if they're watching us on YouTube, but they want to listen to it again, there is an audio version, which uh, we will have posted. But what I found is that it really creates that connection. And people will see that we are everyday people, okay? Uh, We're not the movie stars who are being paid to talk about yoga or super aging. We're not selling a cosmetic or, or a diet or anything like that. We're talking about real life. And I think that when you hear from somebody else who's going through the same type of challenges that you're going through, because we all have challenges every single day. It can be the challenge of traffic. It can be the challenge of uh, 
my husband went out to buy a lottery ticket yesterday and he realized he hasn't been carrying cash and he couldn't get a lottery ticket. He had to go find cash somewhere. Um, so there are stresses, you know, and challenges that we have every day. And those challenges and stresses get into our shoulders, get into our head. Um, we start to ache. We start to feel sick. Um, and especially during COVID, none of us want any of those symptoms because we don't want the, we don't want to be distracted from what is real. So I'm hoping that people will get this feeling of, you know what, it is okay to join in on class. So if they wanted to join a class of yours, how would they do that? Um, we can leave my information in the comments. And if you are listening, <laughs> pull over if you're driving, you can go to my uh, website, elisemariecollins.com. Uh, and I also have tips. You can go to elisemariecollins.com slash P-I-P-S tips, and I'll send you a tip sheet for how to super age. And I can also send you my schedule there, but it should be on the website. Um, I'm also on Instagram and Facebook, Elise Marie Collins Yoga. And all my classes are there. And yeah, if you, you can also email me, everything's Elise Marie Collins, <laughs> Elise Marie Collins at Gmail. <laughs> And I can send you more information. Right now, the classes I teach, I teach two gentle, uh, gentle restorative and gentle yoga classes. So we do get out of the chair. If there's anyone who wants to join a chair yoga class, um, that is through an app that I can also tell you about if you can't find it okay. on my website. Yeah. Well Absolutely. Want everybody to go out to the website. We want you to continue listening. We will be doing these podcasts every two weeks and getting them posted as quickly as we can. Uh, share them with friends and family. And they don't have to live in the United States. They can live anywhere worldwide because obviously um, this is internet based. Um, any last minute tips for today? Yeah, I wanted to say you did mention, I, I remembered you said something about depression and earlier today I was working, we we're working with anxiety. So I just wanted to give maybe a little practice for everybody. And this is just very simple, um, especially for depression, just doing something like taking a deep breath in and reaching your arms overhead. So you could do that now. You could wave your hands. You can even act a little silly. And maybe let's breathe in through the nose and then just breathe out with a sigh. And if you're, if you're listening, you can just reach your arms up in the air. And when you're ready, just, yeah, you can bring your arms down. Simple things that take less than 30 seconds, they can help. They may not alleviate a deep depression. They may not, you know, they're not a cure-all, but when we just do a simple gesture or when we're ready, to take a deep breath. I say that because sometimes if we're feeling overly anxious, it's better to just do something distracting or take a walk. Breathing can come later. But I think that's what I'd like to share with everybody is start to find those little practices that help you. And we'll be sharing those tips in this podcast. That sounds wonderful. Well, I look forward to seeing you again in two weeks and stay well. Um, I know you're sort of slightly in quarantine in San Francisco, but we certainly hope that uh, you can enjoy some of the sunshine. So have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.